All right, folks, welcome to week three with Randy Cummings. Uh, today, we wanted to cover just some things we're looking at from a, a company perspective. Uh, and of course, this is going to affect the type of content we're putting out, the type of products we're looking at bringing on, how we're going to navigate the industry and, and how we operate over the next few months and you know possibly into the future. So, you know, again, Randy has been 11 years in the industry, just a lot of insider insight onto maybe some how some of these have came about and what we're going to do about them. The first thing, and this is highly, highly on our list of interest, uh, just how many people are either starting a flower farm or incorporating flowers into uh, a diversified market garden. Uh, it just there a, seems to be a lot of opportunity there for all kinds of, you know, whether that's a market bouquet or a catering event, wedding event, selling to local forest, um, a roadside stand. There's there's a lot of different things that we see. So let's kick around that for a bit. Sure, sure. So, you know, it's, there definitely seems to be a big uptick in, in flower farms, um, either new flower farms starting up. I mean, we, even perfect example, right? Uh, our customer service manager, Ricky, gearing up to start, you know, start a flower farm in uh, in Nashville. I think people are starting to realize that, um, and through that record keeping we talked about uh, last week was um, penciling some of this stuff out and realizing flowers do an incredible job of paying uh, paying rent for the amount of space they take up on the farm, right? So per square foot, uh, microgreens crush it, flowers crush it. Um, and so broccoli if broccoli and cabbage, not so much <laughs> broccoli and cabbage, not, you know, not so much, but again, it's all about the scale in the market and, uh, how specialized, uh, you know, you may be. So, uh, field growers, it seems like the more they can diversify, the more avenues they have it spreads out the risk, um, larger factory, large scale hydroponic, you know, they do well by, specializing in one thing and cranking it out in assembly line. But um, what we're what we're really talking here is how do you leverage some of that diversification, right? So it may be I'm starting to see flower CSAs, you know, what a great thing to have fresh flowers on your on your dining room table every single week or at your desk at work cheering you up you know, every day while you're in the office, um, pivoting that to restaurants, right? You're, you're already selling, uh, fresh pro local produce to a high end restaurant, um, to be able to sell them flowers for their vases, for the centerpieces on the table. Right. Um, or for their bar program or, or for their bar, bar or program, for their cocktails, right? Not so. necessarily for the point of sale at a restaurant, but when you first walk in, a lot of them incorporate a display up front at the the host stand. Sure, sure. And I mean, you know, thinking of ways to kind of uh, diversify that into channels that you're already you're already in. You know, I remember Nick, you sending me a photo, you texted me a photo maybe two or three years ago of a ice ball, you know, a pressed ice ball right. for for a bar for craft cocktails with a borage flower in it. Right. So, and how amazing that looked, you know, if you're, if you're a fancy restaurant with and now, thanks. I, now I got to go back to the old hard drive and put that into the, <laughs> <laughs> it's worth it. It's, yeah. you know, and it's not a, when you see a photo like that, it's just like, man, that makes sense. Right. Um, but I would have never thought of that. Right. So it, but if we start looking through that lens of how can I take something I'm already doing, I'm already growing flowers or I'm already growing vegetables, how can I push that in or I'm already going to the restaurant? Maybe it's not just talking to the chef. Maybe it's talking to the bartender. You know, do you need mint for your mojitos? You know, are you emulsifying strawberries as a as a garnish in this thing? Um, I had I had a craft cocktail um when i was visiting brad that had a basil leaf in it you know can't believe y'all were drinking without me <laughs> <laughs> how can we pivot and leverage things we're already doing you well know? i mean i'll tell you exactly how that happens so the the photograph that you're mentioning it's understanding diving deep within the co craft cocktail world understanding that these people have ice programs which means there's a bar in chicago it's attached uh, or with the Alinea group 
and the bar is called Aviary. Aviary has minimum of 30 different kinds of ice, depending on the cocktail that you order. It's it's a complete immersed experience. And when you understand that, you know, there there's a difference between all these different ices, not only in the water that's used, but how the shape that it is, or how cold that it is, or the clarification of it, or the adding of bubbles to it. Then you start can can play around as a creative person and as a grower and be like, hey, this borage flower is perfectly fits within, you know, I've I've got these uh I've got three or four different shapes and sizes of, of silicone ice cubes to do at the house. And when it that exactly fits in there, it just makes all the sense in the world that, you know, this flower that's great that has this cantaloupe overtone would just be a fun thing to do. Sure. And when you're a, a bar program like that operating at that scale, you're trying to do anything to set yourself apart or be different or be seasonal or play into farm to table or whatever the case may be. And if you can do that with a flower that nobody else has or, you know, some things that we did on my food truck was we would, you know, uh, statutes of limitations have run out, so I can talk about this now. But <laughs> But we would take buzz buttons and we would infuse them uh, with vodka or Everclear, and that would be the tincture that developed. Uh, we would put a little drop in that in the straw. So the very first thing that you got was this overwhelming sensation in this drink. It's like, what in the hell was that? And you're garnishing it with the same thing. So there's sure. just all these different things you can do. But it takes, as a farmer, the responsibility to go, I'm going to sell to this bar. I'm going to go experience the bar. Yep. I'm conversely going to understand that Hey, this is a beer joint. This is a craft cocktail joint. This is a hotel bar, and it's you know the same top ten national brands. They sure. don't they don't have anything. They don't they're not they they got the one kind of ice. You'd be lucky that if there's a shaker there. But understanding it, a bar is not just a bar is a bar is a bar. Sure. They're all very different. And some are looking for that. You you don't you're not going to sell edible flowers to a sports bar. Right. 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 And you may not have, you know, uh, a five star Michelin restaurant with craft cocktails in your small Iowa hometown, you know, or in Paris, Texas or or wherever. But that doesn't mean there's not opportunities to find different ways to market and and push your product. Right. So, yeah, cause are, we, we took that to the farmer's market. Yeah, we were the we were the person the you know, we weren't selling to. The bar, but we were bringing the bar to the market. Yep. You know, nice. An alcoholic, <laughs> unless we knew you. But, you know, that that level of craftsmanship into a drink that you can sit and appreciate sure. and, you know, be different. Yep. It worked. But um, what every small town does have is, you know, weddings, uh, senior photos, you know. So uh, now these flower fields they are already growing to bring flowers to market you can be talking to caterers and florists and wedding planners and photographers and say hey um for a hundred bucks you know either here's a photo shoot opportunity for you or you can buy a season pass to come on my farm Um, and let me tell you as a photographer you're dying for something different you're you can easily work that into a bridal shoot or a wedding or a senior portrait, the cost of renting that out. Keep in mind, you may only charge 20 bucks if you don't have changing facilities, bathroom facilities. If you bring somebody that's going to dress up and use your flower background as a background, sure. they're going to change outfits. They're going to need some privacy. They're going to need a mirror. They're going to need some lights. They're going to need some facilities. The more you can give, the more you can charge. Yeah. The less that the photographer has to edit out people in the in the background or high lines or garbage, the better it is going to be for them. So the the level in which you execute that and or have some hospitality built into it uh, through facilities or through ample parking or through you know you know maybe a you know, water or whatever the case may be the more you can charge. Sure. It's just like anything else. The more you level up, the more you can charge. And and so there's two two things that come out of that, right? One, don't be afraid to charge. Yeah. Right? When I, 
photographer knocks on your door or walks out in your field, like uh, that shouldn't happen, right? But there are those opportunities out there, and those opportunities aren't aren't for everyone in every farm, right? You might be concerned about insurance liability by having someone on your farm, or you know you might not have craft cocktails uh, or high end bar in your town, or your market may already have uh, six people selling flowers at market, but those opportunities are out there if you're if you think about it and say, what am I already doing now? And for just a small tweak, change, product ad, it Branding. now get it now gets me or or marketing uh, or outreach. It now gets me. I'm already going to that restaurant. I'm already delivering stuff in the back. Why not bring mint and spilanthes and borage and and basil for the bartender? Right. You know, I'm going to go back to the photographers because it's just such a layup. Um, if you build something like this, like you do the field of sunflowers, whatever, you can look at it one of two ways. Hey, I'm on the side of the highway. I know people are going to stop. There's some liability. There's some not like, you know, some of these states they have, you know, if people are experience your agricultural farm, they, uh, the state removes the liability from you. Not to say that you still couldn't get into some hot water. I mean, this is a litigious society, but Photographers are hypersensitive in the fact that, hey, I do this for a living. I have built this backdrop and we charge. But what that means is, as the farmer, you have to have that in black and white moving into it. When you see somebody poaching your background, per se, you can say, hey, I'm glad you like it. If you go to our website, you can actually schedule a session. Also keep in mind that, you know, this side of the highway may be what stops them and what attracts them. But if you have something secret or hidden that they can then really go and experience and and therefore black and white pay for, this is our job. I tell you, man, I mean, photographers get it all the time. Well, just come shoot my wedding, but I'll do all the editing. Just give me all the raws. They, that happens all the time. It drives photographers nuts, and you just don't do it. This is how they get paid. They don't get paid to take the picture. They get paid to have updated equipment, to have the editing, to schlep all this stuff here and there. And to know the shot list and to know how to light it. The clicking of the camera is the easy part. Right. It's that experience and and all the equipment that you're paying for. A a, a photographer is going to appreciate that of a farmer. So I think it's a great relationship. Same thing with caterers, right? Like caterers, I think, are a very underserved population of the food and beverage industry. So same thing with food trucks. And potentially untapped resources but i think you know the key word i i took out of that last sentence nick was relationships right and so we do talk about farmers having to be a welder a hum, uh hr representative an accountant a marketer and a grower right that that marketing and that relationship piece is is key so you know are you talking to chefs? Are you asking to speak to the owner? Are you reaching out to photographers? Are you reaching out to florists? Are you giving exclusivity to a photographer? If you build something banger and then do all the things that we talked about, you know, to provide also realizing that these photographers don't want to come out in the middle of the day when everything's blown out, but they're going to want to come the hour around sunset and the hour around sundown, knowing that, those may be very busy times on a farm. Mm-hmm. Um, so having built in mechanisms in which they are free to come out. Like if you give one photographer an exclusive deal to only shoot on your farm, then it gets into, okay, what can I grow for you? What kind of props can I have on hand for you? What's one less thing that they have to carry yeah. to come out to the farm? It's a hell of an opportunity. You like that, don't you? I do. And general, and all for something that you're going to potentially do anyway. Right. You're already growing. You already, uh, you're already selling sunflowers at market. So why can't, why can't you add another piece of that to that puzzle? Right. Um, you're three quarters of the way there. Let's have a sunflower maze, you know, um, that's going to bring in pollinators. That's going to bring in people. Yep. 
Let's talk about why far, flower farming is even rising in popularity. Instagram, Chip and Joanna Gaines, the advent of farmhouse style. I think the awareness these days of local flowers and what they represent and all kinds of different facets, it, it's, it's chic and it's trendy now within bridal circles sure to have native flowers local flowers sometimes these are very unrealistic expectations uh i was talking to amanda a couple of days ago and she was saying you know a lot of times somebody will want blue bonnets at the end of the summer for different bouquets and it's like look we don't do blue bonnets for we got a a 10-day window where blue bonnets are at their best and it's in the spring when nothing else is growing it's very hard to incorporate that into a, a bouquet but at least it's a catalyst to say, are there flower farmers in my area? What type of services do they have? Where can I get this? How can I support them? It's a lot of education, I think, on the flower farmers uh, side of things because wedding planners, bridezillas, and their and their mothers, God bless them, they, they, they're used to going to a florist and saying, I want exactly this color, exactly this type of flower, sure. X, Y, Z. They, it gets ordered and flown in from the Netherlands or South America and it's flowers on demand, right? right. Versus local flower farms. This is the area we live in. This is the season that, that we're in. It's winter time, but Hey, we have a dried flower selection. It's winter time, but we're using uh, forage greenery and all that kind of thing. It's not just the flower farming, but it's knowing how to utilize all four seasons because sure. weddings happen every month of the year. So, you know, it's it's looking at that, should I get a bootstrap high tunnel for overwintering sweet peas and being the first to market with my flowers in the spring? You know, can I beat Mother's Day? Can I beat, can I have something for Valentine's Day? Um, or... You know, there's some products that just aren't adapted. There's some flower flowers that aren't adapted to South America. So you might not be able to get a blue bonnet out of South America. Right. You know, you might not get Lysianthus li- out of South America. So having those conversations with your local florist, if they're 90% is coming from vendors like that and they don't have access to blue bonnets, Lysianthus, whatever. There's your there's your in. The other in is um these flowers were cut a week ago prior to them getting to the florist. And these are small business owners, right? They've got they've got loss and and shrinkage and um they may bring in I was in the pool. <laughs> I was in the pool. <laughs> I just watched that episode recently, but um you know, just like there's, you might not sell every carrot at market and um, that carrot takes a beating and when it gets home, it might go into the compost pile. It might get donated to a soup kitchen uh, or or what have you. Um, but those four- knowing and planning that if, if we're going to take the watch, stack a high watch it fly approach, that in order to do that, you're going to have some sacrificial sure. crops. Sure, exactly. Um and those florists have that too. You know, they have that bouquet that came in from South America that was already a week old before it got there. And that shelf life on it might be, or vase life in that case, you know, might be another week or, or two. And at some point it's going to look ratty and they can't, they can't sell it. But you selling them a local bouquet just doubled their vase life um, at that point because right. it's already a week fresher. Right out of the gate. So and it's also a selling advantage. point and a feel-good story for them. Absolutely. Hey, we're a local business. We're supporting local. We're in a partnership. Uh, real quick on your sweet pea analogy about you know overwintering, being first to market. There's not a legit cocktail person out there that wouldn't give their right thumb to have sweet peas year-round. It's a integral uh, ingredient for a lot of cocktails uh, that are highly popular right now. Nice. So having a sweet pea and a sweet pea infusion right now, that's money in the bank and a, a good way to utilize that crop twice. So, you know, when your tomatoes are done, you know, uh, you've culled all your tomatoes, you're looking for some crop rotation in your tunnel. 
um, you know, think about some of those fall planted flowers that are going to um, get a jump start in the spring. You know, they might not do anything all winter, but they're going to you're going to be, you know, three weeks to market faster than anyone else um, on them. Um, the other thing about that's really interesting about, you know, high tunnel production on flowers is they're so fragile. Um, so like the rain, they'll they'll discolor in the rain, insect damage. You know, it's one thing to sell a head of romaine lettuce and have a small piece of tip burn on it or, um, you know, uh, a, a flea beetle took a bite out of the leaf. Um, I think most people are understandable of that in organic production. Um, but you're buying a bouquet, you know, that f- that insect damage to that flower isn't isn't going to play out. Right. So definitely opportunity to um, think about doing some protected culture uh, flower production, having a gorgeous product, being first to market, having an in with a florist for products that they can't get in season or they can't get out of South America. Um, you just, you get, you giving yourself a huge advantage. And I think, I think growers are starting to understand that and play to that now. And that's what's driving that trend. So the other trend I think we should talk about is um, the advent of more and more succulents could easily transfer into house plants themselves. I also think there's a big opportunity with ornamentals. I don't, I don't think we have enough time to discuss that today, but if we're talking about trends and we're talking about something a farmer c- could add to that diversified portfolio, as well as they grow as simple as it is, the space requirements, I think propagating and selling succulents is a home run. There's, there's so many things like that. There's, there are succulents, you know, I don't have a lot of background I, I don't have any background. Yeah, we won't or, get too deep in it either. But, but. <laughs> but I think anyone with two eyes can kind of just see see that trend emerging, right? Like um, every store corner, every <clears throat> Instagram, you know, post, things like that. There's just, um, you can see that there's definitely a market there. There's a demand there. Um, there's you know, people decorating a home office now that they work from home, you know, and needing something to sit on the corner of the desk. So um, I definitely think there's potential there. Other things I've seen too, Nick, like um, we've seen a lot more interest in mushrooms. We've seen a lot more. um, I don't know if we've seen more interest in in ginger and turmeric as well. I don't I don't necessarily think that's new. I just think that's been a untapped um need or interest that has never fully actually met the demand yet. Well, right? it's one of those things where uh, the rise in ginger and turmeric are coming from more and more uh, diet nutrition influencers out there pushing that in every which recipe from a smoothie to dessert to braising your beef with it. I mean, it's it's all over the place. Sure. So of course, people are going to want to source a local variation of that. So it just makes sense. And the the succulent thing, I've read, I don't know, four or five articles covering the demand of that through the pandemic. Uh, I get like, uh, it's that magazine. It's for free. And uh, I think everybody should get it if you're interested in this. It's a greenhouse management. It's a free publication. You can get a digital version or a, a, or a printed version. Yep. It's a it's a trade cattle it's a trade publication kind of thing, but you just sign up for it, tell them what kind of grower you are, and uh, you know, they're gonna send some advertisements your way. But it's a great resource. For me, it kinda it kinda looks at what bigger, especially ornamental type growers are doing. And since so much of the food infrastructure industry, hoop houses, shade cloth especially, is coming from that uh side of the world because there's so much more volume and so much more money. It's just a good way to keep on top of what's going on on that side of the world. Sure, sure. I think I think it's smart for growers to um, keep an eye, like you said, on, on what's going on. And what that looks like is that looks like watching Food Network. 
you know, that looks like um, subscribing to like Bon Appetit magazine. And they have those that are regional, you know, Toronto, you know, Dallas probably has one. Well, same thing with Edible. I love Edible. Yeah. So I, I think I got like six, six subscriptions. The Brooklyn Edible is the one to have. It's a book every month. It's fantastic. Yeah. Um, but that's that's a great – if you're going to be in a region or in your state to have a subscription to one of those, it's a tax write-off, you, you're only separating yourself from people that aren't that aware. Sure. sure. And if that gets you onto a trend sooner than someone else, it helps you dialogue with your – you know, with foodies at market. It helps you dialogue with – uh, chefs. It helps you dialogue with produce buyers at grocery stores. Well, and that's exactly why I have multiple subscriptions. If the food industry as a whole is being influenced out of New York, San Francisco, LA, San Diego to some degree, uh, and it's percolating into the country and into secondary markets, if you're reading about that first as a grower and you can get, honestly, a full season ahead of some of this. So by the time it does hit your secondary market, you already have it. Again, going back to being first to market. Sure. What you're dict- dictating prices, you're dictating supply and demand. You're the forefront. They're going to continue to watch you to see what's next because you have the eye, right? Sure, of course. So it's because you understand where these trends are coming from and how to access it. And and you're not going to see that. You're your chef's not going to be able to grab that necessarily off the Cisco truck, you know, some of that stuff. So um, you're in a prime opportunity to capitalize on, you know, on that. Uh, Next up, uh, and of course this falls uh, more into my purview, but we're taking a look at farm influencers. More specifically, and I like this. I didn't want to like it, and I didn't like it at first, and then I had dialogue, and I fully understood, and then it it reaffirmed some things that I have always believed, but that I'd never put into practice as far as this is concerned. So it's the notion of, look, we're going to start a farm to have a content channel. Mm. Now... I have always thought that if I had to go back into farming tomorrow, it's a no-brainer for me that I would specifically build a farm based on agritourism, period. Everything else would be the afterthought. And this is no different than what's going on with farm influencers, that if you think about this from a production standpoint, which is how I have to look at things uh, a lot, it's like, Filming in a greenhouse isn't totally conducive to consistent quality media where you're demonstrating things or where you're trying to teach a lesson or where you're figuring something out and and making that. It's a lifestyle blog, right? Sure. And it's a lifestyle blog that's catering to people that it's information, it's education, it's entertainment all wrapped in, into one. By somebody that you want to follow. Sure. I have zero problems with this. It's another way that I'm very, very interested in ways you can service agriculture aside from being a farmer. You, you're a good case in point. If anybody's serving agriculture that's not a farmer at the highest level, it's what you've done the last 11 years and what you're fixing to do for us. We are serving agriculture by providing the equipment that people can count on. Sure. The extension agents are serving agriculture largely from a desk, you know, figuring out different needs of the farmers and how they can access certain programs or resources or network building. Um, This is somebody that is ushering in people that may have never started a farm, people that are looking to agriculture for a side hustle or as a second income or as a retirement income or simply a, a different way to live a life that's a skew of mainstream. Somebody has to teach this. And I have talked to several farmers that want to do that. They start it, and the, the channels fail because it's inconsistent video postings, it's audio problems, it's, you know, 
we spend four days making a 10 minute video and then we still don't know how to edit versus let's build something in, into which we can have sets and scenes and things that make sense and things that are properly lit and things, you know, we can have uh, all the production value that as more and more people do this coming from the production side, Josh Satin, he has, he has a fantastic channel. He has a secondary channel just on the production side of things. And I'll tell you from, you know, from what I do here at the company, the production side of things, if, if you give terrible audio and we've given terrible audio in the past because we're filming outside and we're filming at a new location and battery packs go down and all these things. So having a farm that's dedicated to that, to eliminate some of those issues that you can have on the road it's only going to make that content better. Sure. So it's one of those things you have to watch for the lesson, understand that that's their story and that's their journey. And it's up to you as the farmer to apply whatever lesson that is or apply whatever value that is to whatever you want to do, but it's going to be different. I think, I think that's the key, right? So there's been a lot of influencers and, and teachers and and educators in in the industry for for a long time. So, you know, I'm thinking of like Elliot Coleman and, you know, Jean Martin and um, you know, and how people are consuming some of that education has has changed, right? There there are still great books that are out there that may have been published 30 years ago that still have great relevant information in them and that's how some people prefer to consume that education but you know we're we're getting to the point more and more where um you know uh like the farmer to farmer podcast like how fantastic was that yeah man to be able to sit on a tractor or uh be in the propagation house with a set of earbuds in and you could be jamming to the same crappy radio station that it's the only one that comes in on the you know on the farm and hearing the same song seven t- played seven times throughout the day or you can learn a little bit about something that'll help you know help your business so um and rest in peace to chris blanchard i mean it's it was a hell of a thing that yeah. he accomplished and we've all learned from and, and i believe it's still it's still out there there was i think they still you know re- replay it right i, I mean you, you can still access it surely yeah but we're blending into the next subject. So I just want to pause for a second sure. and go, you know, we were going to talk about the notion of farm influencers, whether that was on YouTube or Instagram, whatever the case may be, and then talk about online courses. This is quickly blending sure. in together. For me, it's the good thing is no matter who you are, what your personality type is, how you like to learn, there's going to be a resource out there that's not to belittle. The person that's not for you. Sure. Yep. That make that makes sense. And there's there's great content out there. And there's 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 things to I, I guess I would just say is be careful how you digest the information out there, right? So I'll give you an example. There are there are uh great books written and great <clears throat> YouTube videos and whatnot talking romanticizing the idea of farming. And I think that's a I think that's very important. We've seen, you know, a lot of the agriculture industry has been, you know, old previous generations and people tend to stay in the industry a long time. And we've seen that there's less and less um, students going to school for agriculture. There's less new talent, new blood coming in. And and some of these influences are fixing that, and that's fantastic. Well, they're fixing it in a way. It's they're they're not coming into farming as a job, as a career from an agricultural or a vocational or a family farm. It's an alternative lifestyle. Sure, it's a secondary income. It's all that other stuff we just talked about. So it's it's less. Let's turn this into a business. More of we want to live on the land. How do we do that by making it a business? So it's a secondary development from it sure this is why i have the best job in the world right so we slightly and in this podcast especially fall into 
a place you can come learn. The great thing is, is we're not trying to sell a course. Right. We're not wholly interested in like, we don't want the most largest subscriber count out there. We want subscribers that pick up what we're throwing down that are our people that, you know, we can service them. And then in return, you know, we can visit their farm and we just get along. Sure. You know, and, and some of these are, are conversations we're going to have anyway. Right. You know, you and I might be kicking around these same topics uh, during a car ride or on a phone call. And if, if this brings value to someone that, you know, wants to listen in on this conversation while we're while they're propagating or weeding or uh delivering product to market or or whatever fantastic um we want to be part of the conversation we want to learn from them um if we can impart some wisdom great and at Um, the same time i don't have to say hey you got 24 hours to buy this now or the price doubles like all that stuff yeah you know and look there's that's a way of doing it not wrong. It works. I'm just glad we don't have to. So yeah. it's for free, folks. <laughs> so money back guarantee if you don't like what we're talking about right now. Um, but going back to that, that, you know, dissect it. Take bits and pieces out of use what you can throw away the rest. You know, there are people out there that that, like I said, romanticize it. That's great for the industry. But there are some pitfalls there too, right? Where, where, um, their market might not be the same as your market. You know, we, we talked earlier about, um, you might not have a five, five star Michelin restaurant in your, you know, podunk hometown, you know, where you're growing the the produce. Some of these people do. So you got to take some of that with, with a grain of salt and, and hopefully, um, if you are subscribing or are are following someone, learn their best practices, um, but treat some of this content like a buffet. You know, sample some of this, sample that, sample this, and then start constructing your own idea of, you know, what's going to work best for you. I've found that as we watch folks, most all of them really have about the same thing to say. Some of them have some completely different ideas, and a great percentage of that is still very, very valid. I think it just it comes down to who do you want to listen to, who do you want to digest who you're gonna have to listen to these folks for quite a while because one lesson isn't going to get it. Sure. So if you're going to listen to their whole program or their whole whatever, make sure it's some from somebody you like would like to have dinner with. Or sure. you could see yourself having like a legitimate conversation with, you know, there's, there's some folks out there that we're not going to, I'm not, I don't jive with. Right. But that's okay. Find the person, no matter who it is, that you're going to take the most from that is not also going to drain you, sure. drain you of energy or, you know, sometimes some finances, you know, but that's not to say that some people that charge aren't totally worth it. Sure. And I I think um as we're having this conversation, right, and you're learning different people have different systems, right? Understanding what what that is and that there are multiple ways to skin a cat. So you may have um recommendations from this influencer, recommendations from that neighbor, recommendations from that person in a social media group. Um and you may have your own ideas too. One one of the things that we've we've talked about is sometimes uh, a grower will have a fixed idea on how this this is how it has to be, um, or they want they watched someone they got an idea and they want to reinvent the wheel, right? And so an example is we might have a thirty foot high tunnel kit, but someone has the the Big idea. They want a 27 footer for some unknown reason. And they've got it in their head that it has to be that way. And they want to create their own piece. They want to add this thing. And how can we custom customize something to fit around a very specific. Yeah. Who's this way you're talking about? (laughs) (laughs) You know, and, and 
I've seen it time and time again. Everyone wants to to reinvent the wheel, but um, it goes back to there's there tends to be a standard way things are done, and a lot of times um, it's cheaper to take the off the shelf product, apply it to your situation, tailor it a little bit if if you need, but and be a little flexible and be be a little flexible, but. I I struggle a lot sometimes with um somebody wants to spend 10 hours of their time three trips to Home Depot and $400 in in custom parts that they assemble on their own to save 500 bucks on a a product or a part or a kit or a system or and I don't, I don't care what you're talking, whether it's, you look, know. Uh, look, if somebody called tomorrow and they said, I need that 27, I need to be 27 foot and four inches. I need to be this tall. I need to be this long. I want it four foot and a quarter on center. Whatever they can come up with, we could totally do. It's going to take a lot longer because it's going to be a one-off at our fabricators may or may not have to run it through a structural engineer, which is going to add five to $8,000 onto it, potentially depending on what the situation is. That's also going to take four to six months. The delivery of that and the reconfiguring, all of that is totally possible. You're going to spend 10 times as much and wait, months to get this Mm -hmm. or you could have a 30 footer for a fraction of the cost that's already been structurally engineered that already has everything you could ever need and you have an extra foot or two on either side and and the instructions to 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 match it and the the support to help you when you get in a jam or, or 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 whatever it 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 blows my mind sometimes how hard growers will work to circumvent a a processor or, or um, put their own spin on something and and undervalue their own time. Right. Um, Well, and and, and they don't understand the process of uh, this comes up with trays a lot. They want to make this tweak. They want to make that tweak. Yeah, I get it. And that may be the best possible thing for that grower in that position. That's why they want it. And if it's that important, hey, we'll spend $80,000 and we'll build you a mold. And you have to commit to buying 10,000 pieces at minimum. We can do that. It's going to take a year. Yep. Or we can listen to 99% of the people out there that sure. a 1020 is exactly going to fit because yeah. it fits with everything else and they're going to get that much shorter minimum order quantities much better pricing yeah anything people throw at us we can do but we're not going to do it just because one person wants it sure sure so just know if we're going to reinvent the wheel it's going to come at a great cost sure or, or and that's if we decide we can even work it into the schedule or or let's talk about do we just um throw an extra two by four on their bench top so that tray fits you know as is right? right so um all all that to say you know going back we talk time and time again about labor issues labor issues labor issues and this is this goes back way before you know this is pre pandemic you know it's certainly an issue now more than ever but um talking to growers Um, consistently the, when I say, what are you struggling with on on the farm? What's your biggest pain point? Nine times out of 10, it's labor. And it always has been. Um, so whether they want to hire somebody or not, whether they want to, there's never enough hours in the day. Sure. Yeah. You know, so, um, trying to spin the wheels to change the handle on this long handle tool or put a different tire on this cart or or whatever and it i i just 
I struggle sometimes with with people that undervalue their own time when there's there's a, a solution that is right there already baked in. A ten twenty tray is considered by the by the carriers an oversized item. Mm-hmm. The boxes are a little bigger. We get charged more to ship it, whatever the case may be. So a couple of years ago on Amazon, you started seeing the advent of these white and green ovalish type seedling trays, primarily for microgreens. They were smaller. What you have to understand about Amazon is there's people out there that recognize a trend and build something. And they've done this before on Amazon enough to know that if they can maximize the shipping and the storage and all that stuff, even if it's out of if it's outside of industry spec, they can make more money. Sure. If it's twelve cents cheaper right. out of spec. So now it's like people are like, well, can we get these smaller oval trays from you? It's like, no, because that negates everything that a lot of these systems are built. Our five by fives, our cell trays. Our new, uh, you know, the the two and a half inch pots, our net pot trays, our Grow humidity rats, domes, on and on and on is all based off of a 10 by 20. So if we had the smaller one, it wouldn't fit anything. And what are we supposed to do? Come up with another 15 molds sure. for all these other supplementary items? You know, because somebody wanted to have something that was going to ship right yep. for Amazon. Right. And, and. And these these trays and and systems that you've built, and when I say systems, I mean the bottom tray, the domes, the inserts, the 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 plug poppers, all that. Um, that's not that's not unique to Bootstrap, right? Those those are are I there are features baked in that are you know solve a problem and and made may skin that cat differently or in a better way. But what I'm getting at is when you go by Brodan, when you go by Oasis Cubes, when you go by um, you know, media to lay in that tray, there's a standard for a reason. Um so what does that grower that bought oval trays off Amazon, what do they do when their Grodan cubes don't fit in it? They're or spending they're, labor on cutting stuff around, and then they're throwing away twenty percent of it. Yeah, or they're mix matching it in. Look, they're not growing at scale, you know. So it's it's just one of those things where the question comes up: the understanding of why that product was even developed was not sure. A minute, a minute ago, you mentioned the plug popper. Yep. So we sell sell trays. You need a, some people want a plug popper option. We built a plug popper. Get this for our <laughs> cell trays. Then it came to be that people bought our plug poppers because plug popper, we're good at SEO, it ranks up. But they weren't ordering it for our cell trays. Oh, interesting. This product is de- is defective. No, it's for our... Why in the hell would we make a plug popper right. for somebody else's cell tray? Well, it's a 128. Shouldn't it be a 128? How big is our 128? 128 squares can be different depending on who designed it. So, Or the bottom drainage holes may be bigger or smaller, offset or whatever the case may be. So then we had to go back into the listing and be like, look, these plug poppers are for our thing. And then when we were doing the R&D, a 200-cell plug popper as you can imagine, is much harder to use to line up 200 oh, holes yeah, that makes sense. than a 72. This doesn't work. It does, but you have to align 200 holes over 128 holes or over 72 holes. It's going to be a little... It still beats the heck out of trying to shove a pencil up 200 individual holes or right. dig right. it out with your fingers, so, right? And, yeah. and it's also one of those things where well, I tried this once or twice, and it took a minute. Brother, if after you do it 10 times on 10 cell trays, it's it's going to be much faster because you're going to figure it out. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna know to put the plug popper in a 1020, and that's going to kind of help align it, and then you can, you know, mm. you're going to pick up a little trick here or there. But I, I'm uh, always a little entertained when 
somebody either uses it once or more often than not gets something in the mail, looks at it, and without using it, declares it to be not right. That happens a lot. But just use it, man. <laughs> Try it. The that's the limitation, right? Like Nick, you're you're cranking out how to videos as fast as you possibly can. <laughs> and I'm behind. <laughs> but, Somehow. So stay stay tuned for the for the plug popper lineup lineup video but uh yeah well it, look man that's the hardest that's the hardest part of my job between designing a lot of the stuff that we do R&Ding a lot of the stuff we do putting up the prototype deciding what now we have this thing out in the field in actual you know real life what changes can we make that's going to make this better then going through those rounds of changes going back and updating it and then me and my pea brain trying to decide how am I going to explain it to you, Susie Homemaker, guy that was a dentist, lady that was a structural engineer, guy that's a plumber, person that you know is a professional bowler. I mean, look, sure. we get all this, all these different people, all these different skill sets, all these different ages, all these different ways of viewing the world. I'm I'm a doer, right? Like. The guy that we're going to have dinner with tonight, Tim, he's an overthinker. I love him. He drives me nuts, you know, and I'm just like, let's go, let's go do it and we'll figure it out sure. in real time and get it done. And I understand that there's people like me, there's people like Tim and there's people in between and there's people past both of those spectrums as well. So writing a, an instruction book universally, people with an engineering background almost can't stand the hoop house having that much flexibility and should my hoops be exactly 14 foot on center or is it 14 foot inside to inside or is it 14 foot outside of the pipe to outside of the pipe? Yes. And any variation of that sure. within six inches, you're going to be okay. Yeah. Now, would I like for you to be exactly square? Of course, but it's real hard to get with, without a, without a full construction crew with laser levels and all this stuff sure. to get a 30 foot by 100 exactly square. And it's, so it's, we have to build in that flexibility to it, but just know that you're going to be all right. Oh yeah. There's you, you look at all the bracing in them in those kits and, and when those hoops are bent and then put into those ground posts, there's that, there's that tension right on that, that arch that um, suddenly starts to bring a lot of, uh, rigidness uh, to that, and um, oh, dude, and we're forever getting a phone call which like, well, I put a hoop up and it's loose. Well, of course it's loose. It doesn't have any connection points to it yet because you haven't put the ridge pole on. Or hey, I put all my hoops up and they're all like wonky. Well, yeah, because you haven't put the ridge pole on right. yet or the, or the side. You know, it's I, I'm alarmed about how many times go through the steps, or we're told, hey, this isn't going to work. Well, that's funny. We've got 800 hoop houses up this year. Yep. And you know, they work, so I don't know what to tell you here. But I also, it's my responsibility to empathize with that guy. Try to understand why he's feeling the way he feels. Update the instruction manual. Update a video. Maybe we didn't do this right. Maybe sure. maybe it just did happen to work for all those hoop houses. Could we on the next iteration? And listen, folks, you have to understand that we're constantly updating this stuff. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a supply issue. Sometimes it's a on one of the farm visits I do, and I've <laughs> the kits that we have, all the kits I've gone to actually visit. Hell, man, I've never seen any one of them built the same. They're all different because everybody's doing their own take on it. And sometimes somebody will go off book, as in off instructions, mm -hmm. and I actually like the way they did it better. I'm like, you know, that's a great idea. Sure. Um, a, a good example of that, uh, you watched that yesterday was the guy, um, uh, rolling, um, well, the guy in Springfield who had the jig. Oh for, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, yeah. man, that, what, a, why the hell didn't any of us think of that before? It was a great idea. Um, I have to be open to learning. I have to be open to you smart ass. Maybe you don't have all the answers, you know, and I don't, but. I've also been around it long enough to know 
And I think one one thing that you that you unpacked there was, you know, some people aren't great with the instructions. Some people which uh, is, learn, learn which is ways. why we have to have a video version and go. a written version. And you can also listen to this and for the most part, pick it up and and, and call us for technical support and or, you know, we do collaborate with growers because they may even be slightly better at explaining in their language how they use that product. So plug that plug popper example, one of our customers that creates content on their on their own, um, they may be able to show someone how to use that plug popper just like that, that can certainly demonstrate it in that that video way better than I can over the phone or Julian can in an email or, or so on and so forth. And that's why it's, that's why we create the content that we do a, and I've said this before it's training for our people first. Sure. And then it's the instructions for everybody else. So if you have somebody on the phone and you're trying to explain something, be like, actually, let me send you three links. Here's an instruction guide. Here's a bonus graphic that I know the creative team did. Here's a vid. Here's four videos that say the same thing, but in four different ways. You know, having Piper do that series of videos a couple of years ago, it was it was the early version of Hoop House 101. And, and then Julian and I hashed all that out in another series of videos. And now we're working on the th- third round of videos through Tracy, who's doing things much different, but every bit as well. He's just, you know, some people like listening to one of those versions. Sure. Or maybe a combination of those versions. But I will tell you this. The the running joke around here is we're going to make a Hoop House 101 series every single year. Sure. That make that makes sense. <laughs> because the context is going to be different. The Hoop House is going to be updated. Um and I was real okay, you know, it's not upgraded, it's updated. Yeah. You know, we're we're gonna make small changes to make things better. And it, it doesn't fundamentally change. Um so you know, I'm trying to stay in the loop and I'm 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 trying to be uh understand what growers are talking about online and what they're sharing on social media and, you know, stay, stay connected to the conversation because that helps me learn. Right. And, and one of the things was, you know, someone was looking to buy a used high tunnel and they're worried, can I get parts and, and pieces anymore? And while we're updating and upgrading and making small design changes, um, I don't, I don't, foresee that as as an issue right like um uh we may improve the corner bracing well you and i both know that hey you buy a used hoop house are the hoops decent if that's all right here's a pro tip if you're gonna buy a used hoop house just consider you're only buying the hoops there you go yep and then you have the freedom to Decide whether you're going to do a hip or a baseboard or decide if you're going to get a hip and base kit that's all metal from us or know that you're going to have to replace that rusty ass hardware that you lost anyway. Yep. Know that the threads are all boogered up on the bolts. And- know that some of these kits are bolt up, but you can get around that by tapping your own holes and doing new bolts. You know, the the bones of the structure. Hell, man. If you can dig up a dinosaur and tell me you exactly put that together correctly without any instructions, you can take the basic principles of a hoop house. Don't skimp out. Don't cut corners. Do your ground post. Use the hardware. Don't use board and batten. Even that, that even though that worked for all these years before lock channel, lock channel su- you know superior and actually costs less per lineal foot. And doesn't grow mold and. And, and you can actually service your plastic. Buying a used hoop house, hey, if you want that mess, have at it. I don't, I don't, I wouldn't touch it with ten foot pole. If you, if if I had to buy a new car and rebuild the engine, forget about it. Yeah. So we're talking about trends. Need to wrap this one up. One trend that we see over and over again that that we are starting is the the idea of people you follow on social media or non-internet related two farmers getting together at the market and doing an event together 
or working on a project together or, hey, can you have – even if something is simple, can you come help me put the plastic in my hoop house together? Collaborations, yeah, this is this is going to be good. I've got an interview coming up next week that will probably – I don't know when it's going to come out, folks, but we discover the origins of competition at the farmer's market. And it's going to blow your mind. It's so awesome. The Nick gave me a small taste of that in the in the car ride, and it um, it blew my mind. Um, I'm I'm disappointed. I'm not gonna not gonna be here present for that for that conversation in in real time. Um, but uh, so that's to say that I think we're in a new part of life where this is a very, very positive industry. Right now, it's a very positive industry. A lot of young people are coming in. A lot of people are coming in from outside of industry where you don't have some of the competition issues that you had that we're going to discuss. So that's fun where that's upcoming that we're going to talk about. But the the second thing is you're going to start seeing more and more collaborations. We've got, uh, we have the, we had the Jill um, Regan Whispering Willow Farm uh, collaboration. Everybody should be well aware of that. Um, Did a limited run of special colors. Uh, That was the Harvest Collection. She's coming out with a summer collection. We're going to run that at the end of June. At the same time, we have another fan favorite who, he's got a YouTube channel. He's got, he does have an online course. Microgreens guy, uh, Donnie Greens, Don DeLillo. He's coming out with his own limited edition tray. We have always been super collaborative here. We love to visit our people. We love to interact and do things. And, you know, I miss doing the meetups that we used to do pre-COVID. And we have some of that with um, the Bob Wells stuff coming up and the the Hoop House classes that we're going to be doing regionally in person. Um, I've been traveling more. I think the more people can work together, the more their market share builds, the more trust that they build within the industry, the more co-resources and co-collaborations. And quite frankly, you have somebody that you can go talk to that understands what you're going through and that just gets it without, well, let me go talk to my buddy I went to college with. He's an accountant now. He will never get it or she will never get it. You know, you can't go to your hairdresser and talk about, yeah, so what's going on with you? Hey, I'm a radishes, man. They didn't come up. <laughs> and said, they're not going to know what you're talking about. Your parents aren't going to know. To some degree, your spouse that, you know, still has a regular job, they'll never know what it's like. So these collaborations, just from a, a mental health standpoint, is very valuable. But um, I think you're going to start seeing a lot more and more of that. And I wanted to end this one on a high note. Yeah. But, um, you know, that's very encouraging to me. I think during COVID, we lost a lot of that because pre-COVID, there was a lot of people working together and then it all kind of went sideways. You know, there's there's just some stuff that never came to fruition because it wasn't given the the opportunity to flourish. People want that so bad right now. And we keep seeing indications of that happening more and more and more. So I, I think that we're going to see a lot. You know, I mean, it's fun for us to do these collaborations with our people. It's great for their audiences that get to have something special. And, and we're doing the launch a little bit different this time where they'll get some exclusivity through their channels first before we put it out on ours. Sure. It just, it's the right thing to do. Yeah. But and a, and, a, and a thank you to them for, for their help along the way. Right, right. For sure. Right. So it's, We've got at least three of those that's going to happen over the next year, maybe a fourth. Um, that takes a lot of pre-planning. We have to buy the material up front and the color and all that stuff and be ready for it. We also have to schedule that with our injection molder for these projects specifically because we have to go shoot and the people have to be there and we want full transparency. And this one, we're doing two at the same time. Which I think is going to be fun because it's two vastly different audiences that's going to be, you know, yeah, get a little bit new exposure. So it's, you know, it's a, it'll be a great collaboration that's on the board for us, the Bob Well stuff. And I think everybody else can certainly find an opportunity to reach out and be a friend of the market, reach out and be, man, if somebody called us and said, hey, we listened to this, 
we reached out and four farmers went and had lunch together for the first time, man, I would be through the roof. I'd be so oh, happy yeah. about it. Um, if you need a permission to do it, here's your permission. Go <laughs> do it. But yeah, don't, don't wait for that to pass you by. Just be the one to, to make the phone call and, uh, everybody should be better for it. it. It's a hard industry, you know, uh, farming lifestyle is tough. So lean on those around you that can help you through it. And, uh, we love being part of the conversation. You know, we love being part of that collaboration, but don't be afraid to talk. Don't be afraid to share. Don't be afraid to learn best practices from each other and get it done. I love it. Uh, we got one more we're going to record. Uh, that'll be out the following week from whenever this comes out. Uh, we're batching a lot of stuff right now these days. I'm sitting on a mountain of content folks and we're kind of putting it out in order. Um, but the next thing we're going to talk about is I'm really curious to see the intricacies between somebody growing at a mass scale. You have dealt with farmers that are, it, <laughs> it's that weird thing between, is it big ag, the big sure. evil big ag, or actually this is a family farm that just happens to do a lot of revenue because we're really good at what we do versus your smaller market gardener. What is that big scale gardener doing that's different or that's in addition to or was set up differently than what uh, somebody at the small scale is and what lessons can be learned? Sure. I mean, we're talking about that in the next episode. Uh, get me excited. I'm going to cut you off. Stay tuned for the next one, <laughs> folks. That's your cliffhanger. We'll see you next week.